My name is Supreet Singh Manchanda and today is July 3rd, 2014. I was uh, 20. I was a student at the time here in the United States. I was in Lubbock, Texas in uh, doing my undergrad. So it was interesting because we didn't hear about the violence during the day. I guess it had filtered through and in the evening as we got together in the dorms and we started hearing the news it came across in the news and a lot of it came through many of our foreign students. There was a huge contingent of Indian foreign students and so the news started to filter through. Both my sister and I lived in Lubbock and were going to school at the time. Wait, it was spatterings of what's happening, uh, the Golden Temple got attacked, the word, you know, the word terrorist wasn't used and has not been used until recently, but the, the word uh, it was more like uh, everything from dacoits to separatists and, and that was a big thing it was everything was about the Khalistanis the separatists you know and it was always painted in with the color of non-Indian so these were people who did not believe in, a, in an India disbelief actually first and foremost disbelief and and then fear uh, anger uh, that, of course, you know, I uh, heard it first thing in the morning. It was morning here, it was already afternoon over there. We also had uh, family that we had talked to, and uh, so we, we were here. It was interesting, after June, the amount of vigilance we started to have was very high, because everybody who proposed, you know, was a friend of ours, supposedly, who was Indian, who was non-Sikh, all of a sudden, you know, the dialogue just went to fell off a cliff. And so we became the, we were alienated, we became the outsiders, and they were the insiders. And so for the first time, I'd never ever, I'd always identified myself as an Indian. I happened to grow up in Africa, but we were still Indians. And, and we had a very uh, interesting society in Africa, especially because there was no demarcation of your South Indian, your North Indian, Oh, you're Punjabi, you're non-Punjabi. Was, we were all Indians and we all hung out together. And then now all of a sudden we were the Sikhs. We were, the, we were branded. We wore the scarlet letter on our chest. Well, it started with uh, Indra Gandhi got assassinated. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation. It was a bodyguard. First it was, it was Sikh, it wasn't Sikh. And then very quickly it was uh, stuff we heard from our family and us trying to find out are they safe. Uh, I have a, an extended paternal family, a lot of whom were already in the United States. So very quickly we were talking to them because my grandparents still lived in Delhi and making sure that they were safe. And then my whole maternal side also lives there. And so, you know, parents are in Africa with out here. Uh, extended family is in India and ev there's phone calls going everywhere at first to make sure they're safe. Second, to actually figure out, you know, first to actually find out what's exactly really happening on the street over there. And in many instances, we knew more than they knew because we were hearing things here that they were not hearing. Uh, disgust. Uh, fear. Uh, anger. We had close family, uh, some cousins that were targeted. Uh, of course, my grandparents' home was ransacked burnt, uh, so we were targeted that way. Uh, my grandfather was a very interesting character, that uh, he, our home got ransacked over there and everything, and he said, go get blankets and go give them in Tilaknagar and other places after, as it was happening, because they need stuff more than we do. Because we had a family that was already, you know, we, we weren't, I wouldn't say we were wealthy, but we weren't of, of little means. There was a uh, Three, four times, as I recall, three, four times, various mobs came. They lived in Saket. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a brand new colony at the time. Uh, it wasn't very populated. There was maybe 20 houses, or 30 houses. It was that new. Mm -hmm. From our home, you could still see the Kutub Nanar, uh, which now, of course, you can't. Now it's a very popular, uh, very highly densely populated area. Mobs came. And of course, you know, in India, the the nameplate in front of your house had your name. Mm -hmm. And that nameplate 
said, you know, sing mancham da 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 da. And of course, it's got a kanda on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're proud of our culture. And my grandmother actually broke it because she felt that they're going to get targeted. Some of them were servants of neighbors and stuff like that, but a lot of it were people no one ever knew. And they came out. Uh, we had the advantage of actually we were armed. Uh, Ex-military families had some weapons. And so I think there was some of that. But very quickly, we had a neighbor who was a doctor, was a really good friend of my grandma, treated my grandparents. And I, I went to a delightful Hindu family who just Punjabis who just basically, during the lull between the mobs, uh, so there was the stone throwing mob, and there was the, you know, we're going to ride light your house on fire mob, and so we're doing one of those lulls, they went and forcibly grabbed the grandparents of the servants and moved them over, to, and then basically told people nobody's here, they're not here, they're visiting, they've gone somewhere and protected them. So, you know, we've heard all kinds of stories, and, and the only thing we knew that my grandparents, you know, I, I don't believe in hearsay, like, but this is hearsay. What they said was none of the people in the mobs were local. One, this colony was, a, was so new that there wasn't that much population. Mm -hmm. Secondly, these were people who came in trucks, so there was some form of organization that basically targeted and went hunting for Sikh, Sikh homes, Sikh families, and where they could do destruction. The house was destroyed uh, completely. It was gutted. It was lit on fire and destroyed. Everything. My grandmother, you know, she, they moved here after that. They lamented terribly at what it took, you know, for them to destroy. And, and things that the mob, you know, a mob does irrational things. She says, it's not that they stole stuff or took stuff. It's they threatened, they burnt everything, they ripped carpets to shreds, they ripped curtains to shreds. They, they wanted to physically, they went looking, hunting in cupboards to see if any children were hidden. That kind of stuff. Because they wanted to drag the children out and, and hurt them. Well, our family rebuilt. The resiliency, I think, of our family. We're, we're a family that came through partition. And, and both my maternal and paternal sides, uh, some with military, some business really you know we, we went from being ridiculously wealthy in Pakistan to being paupers in India and in one generation built and had our family here it, because on the face of the strength of our family and my grandmother grandfather too to some degree but grandmother especially was just a, a very resilient woman and she said this is nothing. We have been through worse. And I think this is a classic example of many of the families who went through partition. They lost family at that point in time, and they had that experience. Think of it as, I hate to use the word, you know, once you've been through fire, you know what fire is, and so you'll go through it again. And because they had survived that, they were going to survive this as well. And New Jersey. To yes, they returned, they returned, they rebuilt. I, you know, it's very hard for families to live out here, especially when you have a big ecosystem and everything in mm -hmm. India. And, and so they returned in a year. Okay. Our family speak, spoke of it. Friends spoke of it. Uh, it was interesting. We spoke of it in, in the university because mm -hmm. we got asked, mm -hmm. uh, are you separatists? Are you willy-nilly killing people? Uh, it, it's an interesting thing. Violence even though the United States has been through many cycles of violence, the Civil War, etc., we're at that part of our democracy where violence is not what solves the problems, at least not communal type violence. And so understanding and helping people understand that one, we were a pacifist community with a warrior bent, but at the same time that we were the protectors of India and that a certain amount of betrayal was felt and that what is that betrayal because here if you no one can fathom an attack on a, any religious institution it ju it's just you know there's some things that are just verboten forbidden and this is one of those that was just not understood and then the consequent violence that you know occurred after that i'll give you a uh, uh, an example post 9 11 the most visible minority is sikhs 
to a mistake for Muslims, and we had one death. There were many incidents of being stopped and everything else, but we still only had one Sikh that died. After that, there's been more, but in comparison to India, where tens of thousands were killed, you know, between the, the Golden Temple and the riots in New Delhi, uh, the numbers were just ridiculously high. So this was something here, it's hard to explain and people just couldn't fathom it. So we had a lot of dialogue with a lot of people. Also in Texas at the time, I, I was the only guy with a turban in that whole town. And so people were asking, again, you're visible, you're a minority, you have to stand up for something. And very much like the Americans we were becoming, you know, it's like, what is, what is, where was the rage necessary and where was the rage not necessary? really important for us to speak yeah. out. It, it was an education for us, okay. both my sister and I, in the sense that we, we, we got more, we got closer within the Sikh community. Like any community, we circled the wagons mm -hmm. and we started protecting each other, we started asking for each other. It was interesting how our American friends reacted, uh, who were very much concerned about our safety. They circled the community. They got to know more about it. We got to explain a lot more about our culture. They got to know a lot about our culture and what the value, what are the values that we exhibit, and that, in that, en enabled us to sort of continue. But definitely, there became a demarcation between non-Sikh Indians and Sikh Indians, and which had never been felt before. And for me, it was very hard. You know, and um, we internalized a lot of it. We carried the scars. We think even today. We weren't affected because we weren't there as much as people who were there who were you know, victims of this. But we, we became victims of a different nature, psychological nature. We, we stopped talking about us as Indians. And I think that was the ultimate betrayal. After having been the protectors of India for centuries, we stopped talking about ourselves as Indians. Personally, it really accelerated my ability and my need to become American, to belong. So I chose this nation and started to belong here. So I became a Sikh American. I think I did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But uh, after that, now we're, we're very resilient. Right. I think the other thing was as the community banded together, we became, we, ch we mutated our fear and anger into activism and understanding. It, it's, it was one, there was one, there's on the spectrum, there's one extreme. Uh, you know, we want a separatist nation, and there was the other extreme, which is do nothing, and I think we were somewhere in the middle, which is that we want fair rights, and, and that also because we were so far away, you know, we they became mutated in rights just like the American Bill of Rights. We want rights of that nature, and so activism. I got involved in the po political arena over here in the United States, and, and that made a big difference. Yes, we in 1984. 9-11, uh, August 6th, our vigilance. We are hyper-vigilant about the environment, how we are perceived, uh, what we need to keep ourselves safe, and also how we are understood or misunderstood. And so what has happened is we've become very vigilant. Before 1984, um, it wasn't uncommon to walk around, you know, young Sikh walking around with a baseball hat post-1984, it's a rare thing. I walk around with my turban, what's the price? I think there's, it's a complex issue. Uh, the politics of South, Southern Asia is driven originally, there was a colonial factor, that disappeared, there's jockeying for power. Uh, as Punjab got carved out, there are water right discussions, uh, and, and that impacted people's livelihoods. People's livelihoods gets impacted, people have grievances, those grievances lead to, well, maybe we could do this better ourselves, so it leads to separatism. Mm -hmm. And I, so the, the, there's no single instance or issue. I think there's, there is, everybody wants self-respect. And it comes down to a, how are we respected as a person, how are we respected as a family, how are we respected as a local community, and how is we respected as a nation, so to speak? And whether you're respected as, you know, I use the example of the, the great example of the Jewish community, which is very similar to the Sikh community, a small, a small 
prosperous, highly innovative, highly entrepreneurial community within a large, bigger uh, entity, whether it was Europe or anywhere else, you, they're going through always these kind of travails. And we're going through the same kind of thing. We have issues of identity. We have issues of self-worth. We have issues of belonging. Where do we belong? And it's important because we've already been uprooted once with the partition in Pakistan. So making roots is really important. And I think people have different sort of reactions to that. So it, it and it, it's the gambit of emotions. There are people who are completely separatist and there are people who believe hey we can work in a in a new India where we can get if we can get respect and it's about respect fundamentally so I think one of the things I always talk about is 30 years have gone by maybe 20 years 10 years uh, 20 years ago emotions were very raw 10 years ago emotions were a little less raw uh, the world has changed and as Sikhs, I think it's important for us, and this is my personal opinion, that we start thinking not just of India, but thinking of the whole globe as a place where we live, uh, where borders are secondary, where commerce helps us, where we are starting to, and I, I work with a lot of different people, and I can tell you when I talk about Sikhs, I don't think of Punjabi Sikhs. I think of Brazilian Sikhs, I think of Italian Sikhs, I think of Russian Sikhs, I think of Sikhs from Chile, I think of Sikhs from China. And when you start thinking as a global nation, I ask the question, and this is a fundamental question, think forward 500 years from now, and who do we want to be? And if we're there as a Sikh nation, it will not be one of one color or one area or one language. It's going to be global with many colors, many languages, many beliefs with one common theme held together with the fabric of being Sikh. And that to me is where I want us to think of. And in order to do that, we, we've, we've got to heal from this. We are a resilient, amazing people. Should we start deciding that I'm not going to be a victim, I'm going to become the victor. And that's a key tenet of our faith to begin with, anyway.